Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. Welcome to the Jesus King podcast. How are we doing guys? I think we're doing well, man. We are. Yeah. This material has been, it's been some awesome content. Yeah, I, I believe part one and two, man, they were fire. So I'm, I'm really excited for part three. Yeah, and I think we need um, a lot more. We need to talk a lot more about this in the church. We need to really delve deeper into it. We need to get men back on track. Um, because that's the direction I believe, especially the younger men, that's the, the direction of the church in the next Amen. generation. Amen. It, and you know what? Personally, um, I, I'm sure you, you're in a similar environment that when I do look around, uh, especially with my friends, family, like I'm speaking about the men and even the church, I don't see lack of masculinity. It's there, you know, and, and sometimes I know it gets advertised as if we don't have any masculinity, mm. but in reality, it's all over the place, right? Yeah. You go shops, you go wherever you are. If you look around, most men are living yeah. out the way God has created them to be. Mm. Yeah. I th yeah. Yeah. I think um, what it is, it's just being suppressed by certain agendas and certain um let's say political agendas or even spiritual agendas, because there are certain people that have an idea of what they want. Um, there are people who want like a more feminine church. They want a church to be less, you know, confrontational and out there. Yeah. So you emasculate, you remove masculinity. So we become more passive. And I think that's one of the issues because men are naturally, we, we tend to be more confrontational we tend to be more aggressive and not necessarily in a negative sense, aggressive in the sense that we're more likely to be bold and, and we're more not bold, bold. Yeah. Um, we're more likely to be courageous in a sense, especially when preaching the gospel, when speaking about the things of God, sharing our minds, living by our convictions. And that's a bit of a threat, I think in our culture today, it's one of the things it's like the cardinal ethic today, don't offend don't be offensive to the world and whenever you see a church who's living out this offense towards the world where you're speaking the gospel and you're preaching in truth that becomes a threat to a lot of people who just want peace you know quote unquote yeah. peace true um and this is i think one of the really really big issues that i'm seeing right now definitely and well, you, you've already mentioned some of it, which is like feminism, mm. right? Yeah, feminism is, is actually coming within the church, right? And it's taking that masculine role within the church in mm. the leadership or with the men that are there and it's having a big effect, right? Yeah. And often yeah. you'll see, and even if you study history as well, the moment that, you, that the church compromises, right? There is an immediate reward right? There is an immediate growth yeah, because yeah. when you compromise, you're adding a group into your church. Yeah. Peace you're... in the culture, peace yeah. with, around, yeah. With but the then people around as you. time goes, you see, because the spirit of the Lord is not there. The blessing of the Lord is not there. The teaching of the word is also not there. Mm. Therefore you see believers moving out and you see these movements falling apart, right? That's right. And you That's got right. like progressive uh, Christianity is one of them. Mm -hmm. It was big thing, but now if you look at the statistics, those churches are falling out. Yeah. Right? They're yeah. getting empty. They're falling because, and a lot of it is because the younger guys they're sick of the feminizing yeah. of the culture. Because men know they know when they're being sold, you know, a uh, uh, a rubbish um, package. You know, they know that if you're if you're telling them masculinity is bad and feminism is good or the feminine fe characteristics are good but masculinity is bad a boy especially growing out of puberty who's full of testosterone they know that's crap yeah they know that that's not the way it should be that's not the way that i'm made i'm biologically wired for you know this this strength and this um this um push and this drive mm -hmm. that doesn't fit in with the feminine yeah. ideal and so they're pushing back against it. The problem is where they're going with it. Yeah. That's the issue. Well, uh, yeah. we did speak a lot about yeah. that in part one and mm. part two. Yeah. Uh, but we, we definitely see both extremes, mm. as you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. And as a church, we're, we're not saying it's either this or that. No. no. We want to introduce not something new. It's very ancient. The but biblical it's ground. Biblical yeah. understanding yeah. of it. 
Yeah. Right. And um, this is something I even speak to my wife about um, in, in our in our time that she's like, well, this is your role. Like even my wife recognizes my role of course. In, in, of course. in our marriage. And for the Christian men out there, um, I don't want you to be discouraged thinking that in order for me to have a marriage, attract a woman, that I need either to feminize myself to either please a certain group and find mm -hmm. someone there or um, adopt this modern masculinity and try and attract someone else there. Yeah. You can attract a believing uh, woman, a God-fearing woman, if you're living out to be a godly man. It's actually interesting. That's a very interesting point there because there are a lot of... Um women who are like, we need to normalize the feminine nature of a man. You know, we need to normalize making men feminine. And then there was this one specific girl who was saying that on her, she was an influencer. She was saying that. And then the moment a feminine man comes into her life, she's like, yeah, he's just not my type, you know? Yeah. So you, you get that. You, you don't live your life trying to please certain groups or certain people. You live your life in an attempt to please God and do things his way. And I assure you, the woman of God, will come into your life as God has planned. I truly believe that. So, so in saying that, it seems like there is an illusion Absolutely. where um, women would feel like, I need a man um, that is to this specifications, mm. right? Mm. Having these kind of attributes. But then once they start living with this person yeah. or dating that person, you're not meant to be living with them unless you're married. Um, being with that person, they quickly find out that naturally speaking, and even spiritually, since we're talking about Christian relationships, is that something is wrong there. Of course. It's, it's not fitting. It's not working out. So therefore, they leave that person yeah. and they try and find someone else. Yeah. But they don't realize that their core ideology, the, the spirit behind their thoughts, is not godly. It's yeah. not coming from God. So in order for us to have a happy relationship, from a Christian perspective, and not from a Christian perspective, as in to speak, as if we are a group of people. No, this is reality. This is the truth. This mm. is how God intended it for every man, every woman, whether you're a Christian or not, God has a certain design of course, in man and in woman. And he knows what a happy marriage can look like or a happy relationship. Of course. So as Christian men, and even I would encourage the Christian women, if they are listening to this, Feminism is not the answer. Absolutely not. Uh, modern masculinity is not the answer. Biblical relationship is. Godly relationship is. Holy, pure relationship is. That is the answer for you to have and find a good partner and have a long-lasting relationship. Amen. And then, and then considering the realities of the way that God has wired us biologically and spiritually, which we touched on, God has wired both the male and the female in a biological way and a spiritual way, spiritual way to live out a certain role, a specific role. Yeah. And we don't like to talk about that because we like to think about roles being interchangeable. We like to think that, well, women can do what men do and men can do what women do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all just the same thing. And we look at the biblical model and we're like, no, it's not. I mean, like men can't give birth. Sorry, it's just. Not, so, so I can't give birth now? <laughs> no. Oh, man. Men, men, there's a lot that men can't <laughs> do. And, and by tendency and by nature, men are generally not as nurturing as women are when it comes to childbearing and child rearing. But men tend to be stronger and they, they tend to be more, um, more able to demonstrate to their kids this act of protection. And, of course, we're, we're making more broad brush generalizations, but that's the way that you see it biblically as well. Yeah. You see that there are certain roles that are, are given both to a man and to women, and neither of them is less than the other. They're just different. Yeah. And this is the issue with the feminist movement. They look at one as being better than the other. Because I was going to say, like, I mean, um, I've got two boys. Mm. And they are at that stage, seven and five-year-old, where the way we play with each other yeah. is different than the way they play with mom mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. for us is basically we we've got this we call it bashing time yeah okay yeah. which is basically me being a punching back for them 
for the next like 10, 15 minutes, you know, we're just wrestling, rumbling yeah. and having a lot of fun. They cannot experience that with mom. Mm -hmm. But as boys and dad being a boy, a big boy, um, we can have that kind of connection, mm. right? So there, there was a stage where, to be honest with you, if I came and wanted to pick them up, they would not want anything to do with me. Mm. It was always mom. Yeah, in that right? nurturing yeah. phase, yeah, in that age. Yeah. But once they outgrew that mm. um, and they became boys, they're going to school and so on, they start to look for different things mm -hmm. in their parents. Yeah. When it comes to me, they're looking for things that are specific. Yeah. And when it comes to mommy, they're looking for things that are different, right? So, and this is also what we're teaching our boys, right? Is to um, enjoy their identity, mm -hmm. to grow as boys to be men, and to um, understand that this is what God has has for them mm -hmm. you know in in their very core nature so it's not like we have this confusion in gender or whatever it is it's pretty simple pretty straightforward that daddy's a boy mommy's a girl and we're boys and we're gonna grow up and be like daddy yeah. Yeah. and often i hear this with my kids it's like dad i want to grow up to be like you i want to yeah. do this i want to do that so they are seeing an example in their life of masculinity yes yeah. and they yeah. want to grow grow and have that in their life for for parents that are not showing the differences of what it is to be a husband a mm. father a wife and a mother kids are growing up not knowing yeah. what to do with their gender or with their life lost in their lost in their their identity because a lot of the systems and institutions that we have actually root against masculinity so even like you know when we look at the school system that's that's kind of developed to remove the masculinity out of boys like mm. it's generally not a good idea to have like a young little boy who's full of energy sitting down for six hours a day in a school is it yeah you know so like you have certain things that it, it's trying to drive the masculine nature out of a boy mm. but to promote the feminine we don't want that so that's why it's important like you said you demonstrate that masculine energy you demonstrate demonstrate that masculine model to your boys and even if you had a girl a daughter maybe in the future we'll see <laughs> oh, no, i'm happy with you <laughs> um, to demonstrate to yeah. to your daughter because i have a daughter i have two boys um what it looks like to be a masculine man because later in the future when she's going to choose a mate by god's mm -hmm. grace She's going to look for a man who is masculine mm. in the biblical viewpoint, in the yeah. biblical perspective. She's going to say strong, fierce, courageous, bold, also caring and compassionate. So we see the tension, you know, we see the two come together and we say, okay, um, this biblically masculine man, he's going to be strong. He's going to be courageous. He's going to be a provider. He's going to protect me. At the same time, he's going to understand my emotional needs and have compassion and grace yeah. and he's going to have gentleness and all that that comes together it's you know like with jesus the lion the lamb mm. you know the two two sides of the coin you yeah know, two different sides so and, and also in saying that um this reminds me that often a lot of women when they choose their future husbands um they look to their dad as an example of course right yeah um yeah. and if they would recognize if someone is there to just take advantage of them mm -hmm. or if someone is there to treat them um, for what they are worth. And they, they, they look back, they see their dads and they, they see that how my dad treats me. Mm -hmm. I'm ex also expecting that from my husband. So to have that role of masculinity in your household, it's not only beneficial to your future boys, yeah. right? Who will become men and will take responsibility the way you are taking a responsibility, but also to your future daughters. Yeah. That they're going to grow up, and if you're not showing any standard to go by, yeah. then they would just fall for any man. Yeah. And that's, you're, you've are wasted, you basically wasted a whole life yeah. there. You've wasted that, that 18 years of trying to demonstrate to your children what it means to be a true man, a true woman, even vice versa. Well, I'm, we're not really speaking about the feminine nature right now, but it is important that even for women, for the young ladies who are going to become mothers, 
you're demonstrating to your son what kind of woman he should end up with. You know, what that feminine woman who's going to submit to her husband, submit to God, who's going to nurture and care and support the ministry of her husband and those kind of things. It's not generally your job to lead. That's not your obligation. That's not your burden. But it is your your job and duty to submit and show your boys or your girls what it means right, to live within those roles. So especially as a man coming from a male perspective, coming from someone who has a deep conviction about the things of God, so yourself, how would you say that feminism has kind of been a big detriment detriment to the church? Because like we're talking about our families, but how does that extrapolate to the church? Yeah. Well, one one of the things that I'm I'm very sad about mm. is that I don't believe feminism was enforced enforced on the church. Mm -hmm. It was something that we've welcomed. We, we've welcomed, yeah. And, yeah. and this is where I'm sad about, right? It's one thing for you to be enforced to do something, even though the church always fights back, yeah. whether it's enforced or not. But it's another thing where you yourself welcome it into your church. Yeah, it becomes part of your congregation part of your Sunday service. And um, we have the same perspective. We believe in male leadership, male mm. pastors, and so on. And now you see that dynamic changing. Yeah. And in those churches, as we said earlier, they have an immediate effect where they yeah. get a lot of people. But then as time goes on, you see those churches fall apart. Yeah, you see the cracks in the yeah. walls. and yeah, Because yeah. they're not honoring the way God intended church to be, mm -hmm. as well as marriage. Yeah, the right? family, yeah. For example, like a female pastor who's leading a congregation of men, right? And say it's 50 people, 100 people, whatever it is. She would go home. How do you think she would be able to submit to her husband? Mm -hmm. She'll find that challenging, right? Yeah. She's leading men in the church and she gotta, she has to come home and be submissive to her yeah. husband. Yeah. So a lot of these people would often look at passages in, in Timothy, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, permit women not to teach and so on as cultural. Context, yeah. Right? Like historical context. There's, there's a history behind it. Let's not take it as face value. Mm. Why? The question yeah. is why? Do we really have solid biblical background for it? No. It's more the culture is is pretty popular with it mm. and and let's receive it let let's have it in our church so to me you know we've spoken about the church but one point i wanted to mention when it came to family is not having that responsibility of having a healthy atmosphere knowing the roles and so on it's a blessing for your kids but also one of the benefits of marrying a Christian woman Absolutely. is that she recognizes your role. Yeah. Often men, um, Christian men, they marry a girl for her beauty, right? And there's nothing wrong. Women are beautiful or for something else, but not for her spirituality yeah, first. Not for her character, yeah. the, the spiritual character. So what they end up is they end up, uh, the man ends up arguing and fighting mm -hmm. for his role in marriage. But to find a godly woman, you're not fighting for your marriage. You are living out, uh, sorry, you're not fighting for your role in marriage. You are living out your role in marriage. And not only that, she is there to encourage you to live that out. Exactly. So she's not opposing you there. She's actually encouraging you to live that out. And likewise, yourself, you know the role of your wife in 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 the marriage and you're actually encouraging empowering and serving her yeah. to fulfill that role in her life yeah. and if the children see that that's a huge blessing yeah. children will be growing up in a very healthy space yeah right we don't need safe space we need good marriages that would create great space for children to grow up and tackle this world. Yeah, nothing safer yeah. than that, I'll tell you. N not, yeah, no. to, not to live in, in this victimhood mentality, <sighs> no. not to be weak, not to shy away. You've had good foundation with your parents because they're godly parents or yourself. You're, you're building a godly marriage. Your children would have this great godly foundation that they're going to grow up in and you will get to see that success in their life. Mm. You know, and, and what... I really like about raising children 
is the earlier you set the standard and the, you build the foundation, the easier it becomes later on to build of good course. things on that foundation. Of course. Yeah. Often parents and men in particular, because that's a huge, huge responsibility for us, is that we neglect our children's age, especially in the young stages, because we think they can't comprehend mm. much. So there's not much for me to teach them. That is a lie. Yeah. We can spend so much time investing in our children now. So it becomes easier for us as they grow. Yeah, it's um, it reminds me of that. There's there's a Charles Spurgeon quote. He said, "Weep now for your children, and rejoice later, or have peace now and rejoice now by kind of neglecting them and just easing your mind, and you will weep later." Oh. So it's kind of that that idea. You have, I think, you have a good ten years to really solidly disciple your kids and this is an important thing when you're talking about how to be a biblical father we talked about being a biblical mm. husband how to wash your wife with the word of god to 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 um cleanse her with the word of god to instruct her you're discipling her that's pretty much um a, an important aspect and an important quality of your your role as a man the same thing for your kids it's your job but the issue is today We've kind of delegated the role of discipleship to either the church. Sometimes men will just kind of delegate it to the mother mm. and be like, oh, you know, she can tell them about God or this. That's kind of your role. And it's one of the things that we look at um, in fatherhood and in manhood. We look at how we're supposed to be discipling our kids. We, as the men, are supposed to be discipling them and showing them the things of the spirit. Because we tend to look at the spiritual things as feminine. But that's not true. The spiritual thing is the masculine thing, biblically speaking. Yeah. It's telling someone, telling your child, whether it's a boy or a girl, how can you know God as I know him, as I'm close to him, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't really teach something that you don't yourself have. So one of the issues is men are not close to God, right? Relegating that closeness to the woman, because generally women these days are getting a bit closer to God and the guys are kind of veering off, which we're really praying for that resurgence. Yeah. We're praying for the men to come back. And so because the woman is praying a bit more and she's a bit closer to God, they kind of relegate that responsibility to her. Yeah. And she's now instructing and teaching the kids, which is better than nothing. But ultimately, the statistics are very clear. If the man himself is not leading his house spiritually, you are much, much more likely for your children to become apostates, to yeah. not to not end up being Christian in their lives. Yeah. So if you are taking them to church as a man, if you are teaching them the word of God, if you are demonstrating spirituality, they are much more likely to become Christians and to remain Christians throughout their life. Yeah. And and this kind of reminds me of, of the first um, video that we did together mm. was that men are chasing wealth, fame and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And by being busy doing that, you're neglect neglecting your kids, of course. and especially their spiritual life. This is First John chapter 2, um, and that's verse 13 and 14. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. There's a mm. relationship uh, for the fathers that they have known God. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, uh, little little children because you have known the father so th this is something that we have in 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 our spiritual life that if we as christians as, as men if we are not close to god if we do not know god how could we impart that to mm. our children mm -hmm. as abraham said i cannot tell my per my children go close to god yeah but then they'll be like dad where are you shouldn't you be leading us isn't that your responsibility? Yeah. yeah. So this is something that I would encourage Christian men. If you're watching, if you're a family man, or you want to start a family, or you're looking for a relationship, change yourself. Mm. Change yourself to be closer to who God wants you to be. Yeah. Adopt yeah. the image of Christ in your life. Walk like Christ did. This is very yeah. important for us. And it's funny, it's actually in the same chapter. 
first uh, john chapter 2 verse 6 and i like it saying he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked mm. so you can't just claim to know jesus no, you've, you've got to live also got to live it out mm. you got to walk the way he walked yeah it's actually interesting one of the advice um i there was some advice that i had when i was a teenager in late mm. teenagers and it was biblical advice from some men they said as you're coming to the end of your teenage years and your early 20s, you're kind of, you're still a young man, you're, you're maturing. Try to be the young man that you would want your son to be in the future. Mm. And it was something that was interesting because as I'm living, I'm like, how would I want my son to be? I would want him to be pure, to worship God, to look to God, to look to the things of God, to live out his will in his life. So that kind of motivated me to be closer to God, to be better in my Christianity, in my in my spiritual life as well. So, you know, you and I, we kind of walked that together in a way. Yes, um, spiritual twins. We are. You know, we <laughs> we fasted together. Yeah. We prayed together. We we had our worship nights together. We really, it was like iron sharpening iron. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the things I think we, we had that was a blessing that I think the churches need to really incorporate where they're allowing men to sharpen each other. Yeah, you know this is where that male leadership is very important because i kind of feel like we had each other mm. i don't feel like we had the best male role models in that sense in the sense that we had other men who were older than us who were telling us how to do this we we're kind of figuring it out on our own did you yeah. feel that as well yeah, yeah. I, and you know what to be honest with you that takes away the excuse of i didn't have a father figure exactly yeah if you have the bible in your hand that can do you wonders, mm -hmm. right? You could learn so much of how to be a man through reading your word. Yeah. Do not use excuses for your lifestyle, for your current lifestyle. Always look to the word of God and God is there. God yeah. is our father. Isn't he our heavenly Absolutely. father? Absolutely. So if you don't have a father figure in your life, then it's either you don't have God as your father or you're neglecting God as your father. Yeah. So look to God as your father and you can learn from him. Mm -hmm. You can learn from him what it is yeah. to be a man. And to us, we, it's, it's been a blessing that we have each other. And it's so encouraging that we could actually encourage each other to be better men in our lives. Of course, of yeah. course. And there's, there's been times where we've, you know, encouraged each other, rebuked each other, told each other off, you know. It's, it's part of it. Part of it. Um, <laughs> um, but I kind of, you know, in saying that it doesn't negate the fact that we should be doing better with biblical discipleship for men mm -hmm. as well. In the church, we should be very intentional in the way we are training up young men. Yeah. And, and, and young women, of yeah. course. W w wouldn't you say, sorry to cut you off, no, but wouldn't you say that as, as a man in, in the church, right, in your local church, it, th there's nothing wrong with going forward and meeting other men in your church and saying, Guys, I need your help on of this. Course, of course. I need course, your perspective. No. For example, and it's always beneficial if someone's a step ahead of you. For example, if someone is married and you're not, you, that, that's a good advice. He's yeah. a step ahead of you. If you're married and you find someone with children, he's a step ahead of you. He could encourage mm -hmm. you. He could help you out on this one. So it's it's available. Yeah. It's out there. And, and let's face it, there's the reality as well. When we're talking about feminism in the church, it is much harder for young men to come up to a female senior pastor and say, I'm kind of struggling with these sexual temptations, mm. you know, like that's uncomfortable. Yeah. But then you have a man who's strong and who, who understands the issues and who has been through that in yeah. his own life. It can guide him. He, women go through it very differently to men. Yes. True. You know, when we're talking about sexual temptation or even, you know, the, the, the dating world, I don't like to use that word dating, but the courting world, getting to know a girl, Men have sound advice who have been through it and who understand the issues from a biblical and experiential point of view. Um, this is where a lot of younger men who have female leaders who in the church who are kind of struggling with navigating this whole sphere, mm. navigating like, how, how do I do this? And I remember when I was in Brazil and we, we planted the church there, we had a few men. There's, there's, an, epi epi there's an epidemic there of fatherlessness. So... Mm. I think it's something like 60%, 60 to 70% of young men do not have a father in their homes. Okay. So that's, that's a lot. And so 
when we had like, you know, something like Father's Day or Mother's Day and we'd be, you know, preaching on mothers and fathers. I remember this time on Mother's Day, I did a Mother's Day sermon and I was speaking about the importance of both the, the feminine and the masculine. And one of the men came up afterwards and he was talking to me. He's like, um, I didn't really need a father because my mom was my father and my mother. Mm. And I said to him, with all respect, you know, I understand the, the situation you were in, but you didn't have a father. Yeah. Right. You had a mother. She did the best she could. Accommodate. But accommodate. Yeah. But she's not a father. Yeah. It's very different. What you can do now is look to God as your father and look to God and be like, he was my father growing up. And that's the thing that I need to model my masculinity after. But it's very important for us to distinguish that. No, your mother is not your father. Yeah. And your father is not your mother. And you need both in order to develop healthy in, in, a, in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So you do need both and you can't negate one or the other. And this is the issue with feminism muddying those roles. It's like we're not seeing the distinction, the biblical yeah. distinction. And that confuses men. It really confuses them. They end up fr frustrated and restless. And we talked about this before where they're going to go to the red pill kind of ideology because these men are strong. Or they appear strong. Yeah, they do. You know? it, well, man, we could talk about this. Yeah, we could talk about that for so a long much, time. Right? We, we could do another like three parts, right? Maybe we can visit it. Uh, let us know if you, if you actually like it and you want to get to know more about this topic. Mm. Let us know. But this is the conclusion. We, mm. We've did, this is our third video. This is our last video on the topic for the moment. For the moment. We might, yeah. we might revisit it later. We, we yeah. definitely do. Um, but... What is your conclusion? What would you like to say? What's the last thing you want to say? We need to come back to the biblical standard. That's the final thought that I have. We need to come back to the biblical standard for what we expect for men and for women. And maybe we might do one on, um, you know, the feminine nature. We might get our wives in on it. I don't, you know, oh, yeah, that might be, be a good idea. Be fine. But we're focusing on the, the masculine nature right now. We need to come back to the God's expectations for what a man should be mm. in the church, in the family, in their ministries, in the real world, right? That this man of courage and strength, this man of unashamed boldness, yeah. and at the same time, someone who is gentle and caring and accommodating to his family's emotional needs, how to tie that into their spiritual walk. So... As you're getting closer to God, you're influencing your family and the people around you in a positive way as a leader. So Amen. this is one of the things that's very important. And we'll, we'll end it kind of in this um, Psalm chapter one. I kind of wanted to, to talk about that before yeah. Psalm one. I also wanted to share First John two, but yeah. yeah, we can do that as well. Um, Psalm one talks about the, the blessed man. Yeah, You know, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or sit in the seat of scorners or um, walk in the way of sinners. Mm. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, and we use that interchangeably for the word, on his word he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by living waters and he'll have fruit, this fruit. You know, we talk about the fruit of the spirit. We tie that into our spiritual lives. If you are seeking as a man, as a young man, you're seeking the word of God and you're seeking it with such thirst and hunger, hungering that righteousness, you're going to develop yourself. You're going to develop your masculinity in a very unique way, unique from the world, unique from the definitions of the world, yeah. not the red pill crap, not the feminist stuff, but this unique biblical role, you're strong compassionate you're you're full of grace and yet you're full of boldness and you're full of courage you know and so you have these things that tie in together and there's this harmony unison and you literally walk as christ walked it's just it's an amazing thing i wouldn't say i'm perfectly there yet yeah you know no one it's would a say that to strive for. but we're we're striving for that we're yeah. looking towards that and we're you know i always say to my wife keep praying to god and interceding that i will be better tomorrow than i was today you know, Amen. as a man, as a leader. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, to be honest with you, I think this actually sums up our three videos. Mm. Uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, 
the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes and the pride of life. And if you do meditate on this and look at the red pill movement or modern masculinity, you'll find that they actually are asking you to, to chase all these three of things, course, yeah. loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes and the, the pride, pride of life, life, right? Fame, money, attraction, and so on. Um, so all these things is not of the father, but is of the world and the world is passing away. So all this glory that these men are chasing is passing away and the loss of it. Mm. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So we're encouraging you today, men, stand up be biblical be godly be lead, strong yeah be strong lead your wives lead your marriages lead your families lead your ministry you're there you're called not to be someone who's going to come into the church and warm the seat yeah. you're not called for that not towards passive christianity yes yeah. you're called to serve the lord and serve his people and to do the will of god what is God calling you to do? And if it's not, if, if it might not seem like it's going to take you anywhere because masculinity today is calling you to be famous, wealthy, and mm. so on, then by all means, you leave the world and you follow Jesus. Yeah. Die to yourself. Yeah. The Die. most influential person didn't have money in his pocket. He didn't have a place to sleep. He was rejected by everyone and the end of his life he was crucified mm. but guess what his father raised him up so if the world is if you're falling apart or you think you're falling apart according to the world standard right you're not wealthy you're not famous you're not doing well at your job yeah it doesn't matter you're called to do the will of god mm. that's what you're called to do Amen. so we would like to encourage you with that and I really hope that you like and subscribe. And if you think someone really needs to listen to this message, these three videos, someone really needs to hear this message, please share it with them. Yeah. We mm. just want to be an encouragement to you guys. We're not really looking for clicks or views or growth. I mean, it's more blessing for more people to hear this message because we believe it's biblical. And we're sharing these topics with you guys mm. from a Christian perspective. But at the end of the day, we're here to help you. We're here to serve you Amen. because that's God's calling in our life. But what is God's calling in your life? That's something that you need to find out. Yeah. You need to be in prayer. You need to be in the word. So God bless you all and take care. We'll see you next time. God bless. See you guys.